these tech companies. They're now those, the most profitable companies in American history. Facebook, Twitter, Google. Now it's so, you don't know who, it's like they're all so intertwined, you don't know who owns what. And Facebook owns a lot of them. Yeah. Facebook owns a good bit. It's one of the issues with them. And um, so we're, I, I, I don't know, I, I think eventually we're gonna see some form of regulation, I think that. Um, particularly, when they should- Good morning, everyone. Hey, good morning. So we've got one on really on oh. Facebook too. Sweet. Or is that just you? I mean, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Are you on? Okay, now I'm on. So it might be me. <laughs> oh, cool. Let's see. My Gen Two iPad may be on its last leg. I'm, I'm holding out. I'm still not interesting. No, I guess you got to put it on like, like airplane here. <clears throat> hey, good morning, guys. Uh oh. David Coverstone's got another prophecy. Oh boy. Uh oh. He's been pumping them out. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the original guy that you guys yeah, the one that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He keeps having the yeah. game. He yeah. says he keeps having the dreams. Man. Wow. <clears throat> okay. He's right. not saying anything that like would really discredit him. Yeah. And he's even saying, like, you know, I don't want to have these dreams, but I think I gotta be to be in sharing it. But <clears throat> at the same time, a lot of the stuff that he shares is either very much kind of future and or sort of obvious. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not suggesting that he's playing somebody, but it's also kinda like, well, yeah, I mean like yeah, I get but the whole keeps talking about coin shortage. Oh, you know, like and it's like, hey, that came true, and it was like, yeah, I think a lot of people were kind of thinking that was going to be the case. Yeah, we talked yeah, about yeah. that for a while. Yeah, right? for sure. Which so, I still find very strange. But, I still find extremely strange why there's a coin shortage. I don't. All the shortages are very, very, very weird to me. It is a little bit, yeah. I mean, toilet paper's back though. So, praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> we got toilet paper. We got TP. Essentials. Essentials. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. It is good to uh, be with you all. We are back after a couple weeks of no pastor Q and A, and so um, we're excited to be answering some of your questions this morning that have been set, sent in. And um, we got a number of them. It looks like we were kind of built up on uh, questions, not having Q and A for a little bit. So we'll we'll dive right into those and. I do pray that all of you are doing well today, those of you watching live or uh, others that may be watching later on. Uh, it's great to have uh, have you guys on. I don't have you live on YouTube, so I wonder what that means. We're going to check on this for a moment. I don't know. I'm going to go straight to it. Looks like I got it. It shows me live. Oh. I like this first one, man. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Wow, technology. Look at this. Really Start recording. That's that's. Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. We're getting up close and personal here. Let's try to do this. Maybe end it. And maybe. Excellent condition. Mm. <laughs> All right, guys, I'll try and Okay, well, <clears throat> I don't know what's happening with YouTube, so we are going to go ahead and just do Facebook Live this morning. So, sorry to our YouTube users, this will get posted later on. So, anyone want to open us in prayer this morning? Do it. I'm sure. <laughs> 
Father, we, uh, we thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord, the very gift of the breath of life this morning, Lord, the uh, things that you have caused to work together for our good, uh, just to allow us to get up and out and around this morning, Lord, uh, uh, thank you. The words, thank you, are so inadequate. Lord, we pray that our time today pleases you. We pray that, uh, that it's a blessing uh, to those viewing and to you, Lord, uh, pray that you would uh, guide the, uh, the answers today, pray that you would uh, uh, guide the responses and, and comments following. We, uh, we love you, and we just thank you for this time that you give us and this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, guys. Well, the first question that was sent in to us this morning is, will you explain 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 and 17? Is this in reference to sin resulting in physical death versus sin that leads to spiritual death? Let's go ahead and read this first. Again, this is in 1 John chapter 5. This is uh, admittedly a somewhat confusing passage of Scripture. A couple verses here. 1 John 5, 16 and 17 says, If anyone sees his brother sinning, a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Okay, um, so this is, uh, and actually I think answers another question we've got here later on somewhat, is uh, this is the Apostle John writing, and he's writing here this passage uh, that, as I mentioned, is a little confusing. I don't know if, if either of you want to yeah, take a stab at it, or you want, <clears throat> you want me to offer my thoughts? Hey, go ahead. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> um, so here's the deal. <clears throat> the short answer regarding this passage is I don't entirely know. Um, <clears throat> we, I don't think we really know exactly what John is saying here. There are passages in Scripture where um, you know we study it, uh, we 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 seek to apply uh, sound hermeneutics and biblical exegesis to try and pull out of it what it means. But there's there's occasionally passages where you're just kind of left going, man, I, I don't know that I know fully exactly what's being communicated here. Um, and I don't know that I've read a commentator or a theologian who I feel like after reading them sort of nailed it, right? Uh, I, think, I think fairly consistently people have expressed, here's my thoughts on it. But similarly, like not entirely sure. Here, here's, what I, here's what I do believe. <clears throat> um, regarding the sin that's being talked about here, and it's a little odd, right? Because why would John suggest that there's a sin maybe that we shouldn't pray about or pray for? <clears throat> when I read this passage, when I look at this passage, here's kind of what I take away from it. One, um, John writes here that if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, <clears throat> This language is consistent throughout 1 John, okay? And so I think when he says brother, I think he's referring here to um, a brother or sister in Christ, okay? So I think this is probably uh, another Christian. Mm -hmm. Some people suggest maybe this is kind of a general term for brother and that this could be an unbeliever. I think that this is a believer, okay? That's, excuse me, that's my personal opinion. Toward that end, we are exhorted here to pray for our brothers and sisters if we see them in sin, right? Mm -hmm. That's something we should be praying about. So that's the one of the most important things we can consider in this passage is we are called to pray for our brothers and sisters in the Lord, especially when we see sin in their lives, okay? So that's the first thing we should take from this passage. Now, what about a sin leading to death? Some people suggest that that sin is sort of as like the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and that and that that leads to spiritual death. Um, believing that this is a brother, uh, and that it's somebody who's saved, and that I don't believe we can just lose our salvation, and that's a whole other topic that we've considered mm -hmm. in past Q and A's. I don't know that that's the sin that's in view here, but it could be. Um, the sin that I think is in view here is really sin that maybe is leading towards physical death. Mm -hmm. And I do think there is a precedent in scripture, we see it in the Old Testament, um, where an individual's life is, I mean, you could say, cut short, for lack of a better term, because of sin in their lives. That in God's grace and his mercy, he chooses to take them home uh, before they just sort of go to a place in their life where they, they really live somewhat of a ruined life. Mm -hmm. Now, we got to be careful with that, too, because what we can find ourselves doing 
if we really take it that way, is that anybody who dies in a way where we kind of think maybe is unexpected or early, um, you know, not 80 years old in a hospital bed, but younger than that, that we could go, oh, well, maybe they were committing some sort of sin then and God took them home. Yeah. And we got to be careful that we don't go, oh, well, that's the case in every situation. But I do think there are times when the Lord would choose because of our own kind of foolishness and bend towards sin that in his, again, in his grace and his mercy, he may take us home. I know of a particular pastor that has long said that's his prayer. Lord, if ever, if ever I am kind of wandering in a way where it's going to defame your name, my family, the church, etc. Lord, take me home. Mm-hmm. Just take me out. And um, that's a pretty incredible prayer to pray. Mm-hmm. And sure. regarding whether or not we should pray about that, that's the piece that I'm a little, that's where I, that's where I really find myself going, man, I don't know exactly what John's saying there. And so for me, if I'm praying for somebody, I'm doing my best to pray for them humbly, Seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't know what's going on in their life. You do. Here's what I see, Lord. And I'm just praying that you bring them back, that you work in their life. I don't know that there, I don't think there's going to be judgment that comes upon me for like accidentally praying (laughs) for a sin leading to death. You know what I'm saying? Um, God's gracious, right? So um, that's my thoughts on it. I don't know if you guys have any other perspective you'd want to share on that. Probably confused. Not the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tough. I mean, this is. I mean, this is an interesting verse. I mean, because for the wages of, I mean, we read about for the wages of sin it is death. Um, and I do believe that when we look at this, it's, it is important to distinguish that sometimes when we enter into sinful behavior, the outcome is is definitely death could be an immediate outcome of the sin yeah. you're entering into. And I think about um, people who abuse drugs and alcohol. If we look at the the sin of drunkenness, um, if you continue to go down that path, certainly you are you are going to die. Right. Um, and I also think that we've discussed in the past as well that there is a differentiation between sin and sinning. It, that there is a there's a difference in the two. It, sin mm-hmm. itself is there is the sin and the original sin of Adam, and then there's the habitual sin of sinning continually. Yeah. So sometimes mm-hmm. we get them kind of twisted, and then you look at and then you put that in context to this reference, you go, yeah. well, now I'm really confused, right? So right. it's particularly in the, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, so it's like, all right. Habitually sinning in about, yeah, his willful, original, disobedience, will, willful yeah. disobedience in original sin. What should you do about that? Um, you know, and <laughs> so it, I do think this one is, is quite confusing. Yeah, I do. I think yeah. it's tough. But I think it's important to remember as believers is that, like as you said, it's important for us to not be in sin regardless. Right. Regardless of how we see the outcome, whether we can say, well, this sin isn't going to lead me to a physical death. Right. Sure. It may not. I mean, stealing or, or whatever, any sin you might enter into, gossip, um, might not lead to an actual physical death. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we don't not enter into them because we don't see an immediate result of it. Like, right. you know, all there is, you know, there's going to always be a consequence for sin, regardless of whether we see it as a physical death or a spiritual death. Right. And so the point for us as believers is to just continue to, to abide in Jesus Christ and walk away right. from right. sin. I think it's like we don't try and. I think what could be the danger in this is that when we look at these verses is we could say, well, there are quote unquote good sins and bad sins. You know, this is, what this is like, you know, we, yep. we, well, not all sins lead to death, but, but regardless, we should stay away from all unrighteousness. Yep. We should avoid all unrighteousness regardless of the degree to which we think we are sinning. All sin is sin in the eyes of God. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that that's how I you know yeah. I, I still think, <clears throat> I think that's yeah that's a great point. I think ultimately when we come to passages like this, let's take from it what we can be confident in, and that is there's an exhortation here to pray. There's an exhortation here to uh, refrain from sin. Um, those things we know clearly, and um, some of these other things are uh, a little bit more difficult for us to to comprehend. And so we just trust in what we know and we go with what we know. Mm-hmm. So. For sure. <clears throat> All right, question two. Uh, in, the, in, in the same vein, in terms of uh, here in 1 John, uh, the books of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, what are your thoughts about these being individual letters sent at different times, or perhaps a group of letters sent at one time, but distributed to or intended for different persons within the church? Uh, for example, 1 John for the main body, 2 John for the women of the church, and 3 John for church leaders. Uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Uh, 
I guess how I would respond to this, um, some of your thoughts here, uh, and I don't recall, I, I don't know who asked this question. I can't, um, that's, that's not in my notes here. Um, I do believe, okay, I do believe there are individual letters. <clears throat> I, in my opinion, they were sent at different times, <clears throat> but they could have been sent together and then distributed somewhat differently. Um, First of all, again, I do believe that they are all written, all three, by the Apostle John. Remember, John was the youngest of all the apostles. Uh, he also lived the longest. Uh, first, second, third John are written roughly the end of the first century. So in that range of like 95 to 98 AD, um, I think John died in 98 AD. Um, I think some of the confusion that exists around these letters, specifically first and second John because who they're written to is somewhat cryptic. There's titles, not specific names. Whereas third John, there's a name written. <clears throat> um, I think that part of that could be less clever language and more because of the increasing persecution that the church is experiencing during this time. Toward that end, first John is written to dear children. Um, so those are maybe either uh, just converts of the apostle John and his ministry. It could be the members of the church in general. Um, Second John written to the elect lady. That could be a woman who is hosting a church in her home, a home church. It could be the church in general, um, which would then speak to um, the, uh, the title that he uses, the elect lady and her children. So the, it could be the church and the members of that church, right? Um, <clears throat> And then 3 John, we know, is written to Gaius. Um, and so that is a, given a specific name there. So again, could that then be, as you suggested, church leaders, Gaius being one of them? Mm -hmm. It could be. I mean, your suggestion here in this question, uh, those things could be true. We don't know them necessarily to be true or false. Um, but again, what I think is John's writing three different letters um, late in the first century, and if I had to choose, I think I would probably say that um, he's writing all three of them to groups of believers, not necessarily to one person. The elect lady, I don't know that I have really an opinion on that. Could be the church, could be a woman who's hosting the church. Mm -hmm. In the end, and again, this kind of goes back to that same line of reasoning, right? In the end, it's intended for believers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what he says to those believers stands, you know, true. Whether or not it was the group of them or one lady who would then distribute the information, I, I don't know. I, yeah. And a couple of things I've, I've read and were reading this morning. Um, first, kind of the, the general believers in Asia sure. um, about the joy of the gospel. What does is, what is a believer's life look like? How does the believer interact mm -hmm. with the world around them? Um, second John, more specifically to a church, yeah. a church body. Um, and they are a warning primarily against false teachers, and, yeah. and it's a mm -hmm. it's a really short letter compared to a lot it of is, others. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then third, specifically to guys, and about holding fast to the truth. Yeah, you know, you, the first two, I, I agree. I think they were sent at different times um, yeah. to different audiences, but to be conveyed to the whole. Yep, um, exactly. Yep. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Likewise. Yep. Cool. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, Bobby and Jimmy, this one's yours. Okay. <laughs> Throughout the Bible, Isaiah 41.10, Psalm 16.8, Psalm 110.1, Exodus 15.6, and many more verses seem to favor the right hand or the right side over the left hand or the left mm -hmm. side of God. Is there a biblical basis for this? <laughs> I kicked this over to them because Jimmy asked me this morning right before he was like, hey, what do you think about this? I don't know. <laughs> but, and so I'll, I'll say what I, what I... Share what you know. Asked. Share what so you know. What, yeah. what yeah. I also noted was that those, the question is kind of God's right hand, God's right hand, God's right hand, but I think it's the first song reference. It actually is the the writer, the author, saying that God was at my right hand. So it kind of flips it. There oh. is maybe some significance oh. of the right hand or right side, but unless, as somebody smarter than I pointed out, unless God facing the other direction. <laughs> I kind of envision, maybe it was like that. Maybe it's like the high five on the football field. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. Um, All right. But... Uh, 
Honestly, I, I don't know. I don't know that, that, that there's a significance. And, you know, I think generally we think of being seated at the right hand is a position of mm -hmm. power, of authority, of, yeah. of uh, for lack of better words, accountability or, or unity in leading. I mean, there's, right. there's, here's my... I don't, I don't want to lessen a role. So, um, you know, seated at the right hand of the Father, we know that Jesus is in full authority with the Father mm -hmm. and the Spirit. So at the right hand is, is a position of leadership and, and authority. Yeah, I, I think that, that's where I go. I mean, yeah. is there a biblical basis for it? Well, yeah. yeah. Because the Bible consistently references it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I... I don't think we could say inconsistently. Obviously, there's a verse there that kind of speaks to it differently. But I think what that does, that verse in Psalm kind of kind of reinforces for us that it's almost a figure of speech that conveys power and authority. So even for the psalmist to say, God is at my right hand, right, yes. suggests that he's at a position of power and authority. And I think, in my opinion, that's really what it goes back to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father, he's been given power and authority. I mean, I think, if anything, I would go to that, that it just consistently communicates it's a place of power and authority. Whereas, what does is, what is God say about his enemies? I will make my enemies a what? A footstool, right? Yeah. Whereas then the one who's at his right hand is given power and authority. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's my opinion on it, but I, don't, I mean, I'm sure there's somebody who knows of like, Rabbinical tradition, that, well, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, right? Like, yeah. Which probably only comes from this, from the, the right, yeah, you yeah. know. And again, the left it was the left hand was the one in, in most cultures that you didn't want to shake and hands, right? There is a cultural, there is a weird cultural significance in most of the older world where right. the left hand is not utilized for anything. You know, it's, it's India, the Arab world, uh, parts of Asia. The, yeah. the left hand is reserved for. And interestingly, too, when I was when I grew up in Catholic schools, too, like we were told to only write with our right hand. Yeah. We were taught that the left hand is bad. That's why I write left handed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was rebellion. Was rebellion. <laughs> I rebelled against my nuns who were uh, uh, in first grade. But true story. Um, but there is there is a there is throughout most of the ancient world cultures this use of not yeah. using your left hand. Raise your right hand. Raise your right place hand. your right hand yeah. on the Bible. Yep. I mean, no doubt it all goes yeah. back to the Bible. It does. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there's a cultural significance that goes even predating the actual writing yeah. that would have lent itself to. Yeah. It's interesting, even, even in skateboarding, if you lead with your left foot, it's called goofy. Yeah. It's a goofy stance. Even, yeah. you, so even, well, people say it's a right-handed word. Right? Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> so there's even, like, there's cultural connotations even in our own culture where it's somehow leading with your left foot or utilizing your left hand is, is not the proper method yeah. by which you do something. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, guys, uh, I think we would just say um, there certainly seems to be a biblical basis mm -hmm. that supports what maybe is a figure of speech that really speaks to authority being at the right hand of, uh, of, of God. Um, so if any of you have any thoughts yeah. on that, or if you have some history you'd love to share with us, by all means, we are all ears. Okay. <clears throat> How can a Christian recognize different idols that they may have in their life? I know idols can be physical items or ideas or habits, but how should we evaluate our lives to see if we have these idols and what should we do to be rid of these idols? Um... Go for it. Yeah, I'll go for it. So you guys have answered a lot this morning. So um, one, we have a biblical commandment as Christians that we will have no other God from the Ten Commandments. They, 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 you know, from the beginning when the first laws of Moses were handed down, that we will have no other gods before me. And I think most Christians, when we approach the issues of idols, they would go, well, they they go back immediately to this reference and they go, well, I don't worship idols. I don't have any other gods in my homes now. For some people, they do, and we've talked about this. People who have like ornamental Buddhas in sure. their home yep. because there's times that they become, become trendy. I remember living in Hawaii where it was like trendy and cultural to have like the different totems and, and false gods in your home yep. or on necklaces. So those would definitely be blatant examples of saying no idols in your home. Those are actual idols. Those are false religions. So we can remove that immediately. But I think where, where Christians kind of struggle is they see this. Well, I don't have any. I don't have any false gods in my home. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the truth is, is that 
most anything we have out there outside of the Christian life can become an idol. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I would say in our culture and the American <clears throat> culture, there is a high degree of prevalence of idolatry yeah. in our culture. We have yourself could be an idol. Yep. Um, if you, uh, your possessions can be idols, your hobbies can be idols, your desires can become idols. Um, your, uh, something as simple as even the sports teams that you follow can lead to a degree of idolatry. I mean, mm -hmm. we've talked about this for years that in the South, there's a joke that says the official religion of the South is college football. Right. And when you look at how people are so deified and dedicated to the college football team they follow, well, hey, they attend regularly, they tithe, <laughs> uh, they make yeah. it a big part and practice of their life, they worship it, they yeah. glorify it. Um, not that college football is wrong. And this is where I think there's the danger in this, is that we're not saying these things are wrong. But when you put them to a higher degree in your life, in your relationship with Jesus Christ, and then you are unwilling to let that thing go, I would say, yeah, you're, that's an idol. This yeah. has become something in your life that you have created as a bigger God for you than the God, God yeah. the Father. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, the danger in idols and idolatries. And so we, like, for me, it's like, I think Christians have to recognize that they have to separate the, the, the two. You know, we have a biblical command, you'll have no other God before me. And they go, well, that's okay. I don't have any, I don't have a Buddha yeah. or a, yeah. or a, or, and it's weird too. I've even seen sometimes where it's like trendy and fashionable to have some of the, the Hindu gods yep. in your home as decoration. So people go, I don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. But however, um, yeah. do your earthly desires for the things of this earth overwhelm you in your pursuits other than that of the heavenly pursuits that Jesus has called you to Absolutely. pursue more so? And yeah, I'd say those become idols in people's lives. Yeah. Um, but and sadly, I think in the American culture, I think some more than others, but everyone is susceptible to it. Because uh, we all live in a fallen world. But in America, I think the, the God of materialism, mm -hmm. money, pursuit of self. Uh, because in America, we have this sense of like, I must make my way. I must be the one doing. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting that in the cultures that I've experienced with around the world, a lot of them are very like, can have a sense of contentment in where they are in their current place. Where in America, it's like we always have to like, strive to create bigger, faster, newer, stronger, better. All right. And in that way in itself, because we are in a culture that says that you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right. we have a tendency to make our own pursuit and desires for our jobs, our kids, our whatever. Well, that's, that can become a form of idolatry. So when I look at the standard for me, it's, is this thing in my life, do I pursue it with greater passion than I pursue Jesus? Yep. And am I unwilling to ever separate from it? And if you have something in your life that's, that's those two basic yep. rules right there, yeah, you have yep. an idol. I would say that absolutely. Yeah, I, I absolutely want to understand that. I had just a little bit in this in this past you know, two and a half weeks or so. I've been talking kind of about this thirty day challenge and getting rid of stuff. Yeah. And yeah. which, as far as a thirty day challenge, I failed miserably. But we have been going through this process of looking at things, stuff, maybe even apps on the phone or or other things, and what value does this have? What what worth does this bring into uh -huh. my life, and do I ascribe it more value than I do my relationship with God? Yep. Mm -hmm. Can I easily let go of it? Exactly. The the extent to which we struggle to let go of something exactly is an indicator of, of whether it's an idol or not. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. So yeah, I think that's the first the yep. first challenge is can I easily let go of it? Yeah. You know, right. people who talk about well, I'm not addicted. I can quit anytime I want it. Yeah. Um, okay, do it. Do it. Do it. Exactly. And, and if you can successfully for however long, then okay, maybe, maybe you're not. Yeah. But if you struggle to let go of that thing, yeah. it, it, exactly. it has become an idol. So. Exactly. And, and I think too, we have, <laughs> sorry, so we have to be attuned to the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it, it, it too, if the Lord comes to you and says like, hey, that thing that you're really yep. after, yep. you need to give it up. You exactly. need to obey. Exactly. You need to obey. And sometimes we go, well, this isn't bad. Or if even the Lord even sometimes gives you a mild correction to say, you need to put this in its right place in your life. Yeah. Like college football, right? I'll use college football. I love college football. Um, I'm not going to answer who you are. I don't know you. Um, oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, if you get the correction from the Lord to say, hey, you need to put this in right perspective in your life, you need to heed the correction of the Holy exactly. Spirit. You need exactly. to do that. Yeah. And then, you know. <clears throat> well said by both of you. I agree. Um, I would say simply... If God asks for it and you struggle to give it, it's an idol. Yes. And that can be anything. I think we're often quick, like you said, to go, okay, maybe it's college football. 
What if it's your family? Mm. What if it's your wife? Um, right? Yeah. What if it's, and, and, and you say, well, what, what, what do you mean? Well, ask yourself, like, if, if <laughs> it, how, how much are you holding on to that? Yes. Versus your relationship with the Lord, right? Yes. Or, um, or even is it, what if it's your ministry? The church, right. so, absolutely, know, the ministry. Is, yeah. What if, it, and, and, you know, and it's tough for us to understand, well, like, well, how would the Lord ask that of me? Well, it's it's about dependence. Yep. It's about looking at, well, how does your life impacted by maybe disruptions in those areas, even, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like, with, if things aren't great at home, and I'm not, I know how disruptive that is. I know how difficult that can be, right? But what does that do to your relationship with the Lord? Yep. Right? Like, yep. Are you able to continue to seek the Lord, be at peace with the Lord in all circumstances, in all situations, mm -hmm. trusting in Him, depending on Him, even if certain areas of your life are disrupted, right? And, and I think we need to be able to look at those areas and go, man, maybe this has become an idol to me. Yep. Right? For sure, man. For it's sure. in Psalm 139 that, you know, the beginning of it, it God knows everything about us. He knows right. us way better than we know ourselves. But the end of Psalm 139 is that invitation for God to search us and know us. Yeah, yeah. Um, that invitation for him to point out to us the things that he already knows. Yeah. Um, and that, that's where those eyes yeah, can be yeah. revealed. You know, point out, sure. show me what's in me yeah. that's not of you. Yeah. And I think where this can get confusing sometimes is that what can become an idol in a lot of people's lives, biblically in itself, is not we're not told to refrain from. Mm -hmm. So like, can your physical health become... An right. idol working right. out can that become an idol? Right. So well, like, hey, I'm taking care of my body. What do you mean? What do you mean I'm wrong? It's, it's the like, temple. It's the temple, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Or, or, um, golly, there's like, um, there was another one that just came to mind too. But I think of it, like people's physical health. People go, well, wait a minute. Like, I'm supposed to take care of this thing. Yeah, but if you're elevating that mm -hmm. to such a level, the like, you know, where that's your preeminent thing. Yeah, it's right. an idol in your life, and it's definitely in the in the realm of becoming right. one. And one guys, one. if I might. Um, and I just feel the Holy Spirit nudging me on this. And, th and I'm not saying this from, listen, I've said this a million times, okay? Um, and so I want to make sure that people understand it and know that I want to be gracious. Um, but w is, is your personal safety an idol? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, we are in a time, and if you've, you've, if you've heard it once, you've heard it in nearly every sermon for the past several weeks. And that's not, listen, please hear me clearly. That's not me saying that I'm basing that off of whether or not you are physically in the sanctuary on a Sunday. I'm not saying that, okay? Mm -hmm. But is your personal safety an idol? Um, because I think for a lot of people it is. Mm -hmm. And how do, we, how do we evaluate that? Well, not that oh, if I'm wearing a mask or if I'm social distancing or if I'm being careful about the places I'm going. Listen, there are even, even, having, even having had COVID and supposedly having some immunity now, there's certain places where I'm like, I'm not taking my family there. That's like a cesspool, like, like a, a yeah. literal bacterial yeah. cesspool. Like there's no reason to go in there right now when there's all right. this stuff going on. Okay, so I'm not saying we're not to be cautious, but is the Lord calling you to minister in certain ways to certain people? And might you go, well, I can't do that right now, Lord, because of a pandemic. Then I would say, yeah, your safety, your personal mm -hmm. safety has become an idol. Yep. Plain and simple. And so we've got to continue to be seeking the Lord, seeking the leading of the Holy Spirit, so that we can with confidence say, hey, I'm being smart, I'm being cautious when, when appropriate, but Lord, my life is surrendered to you, whatever you yeah. want from me, right? Yeah, for sure. Like, I'm, listen, I'm anxious. If I was given the opportunity to go to Puerto Rico for ministry next week, I would. If I was given the opportunity to go to Ethiopia next week, I would. Uh, I can't go there right now. One, I can't afford a flight. <laughs> and, um, and two, you can't get into the country right now. But man, if yeah. even even with pandemic going on, if they said, hey, here's an opportunity and the Lord said, go, I, I got to tell you, I'd go. I went to New Mexico last week. So glad I did. Man, the time spent with the students there was absolutely fantastic. Have some people said, don't get on a plane? Yeah, they have. And, if, and listen, if you're at peace about that and you know the Lord has closed that door, fine. But the Lord very clearly told me, go. Yeah. And, and I'm grateful for it. Yeah, so. I'm awesome, dude. Okay? I'm awesome. All right, let's move to the next one. Yeah. Ooh, how should we approach those who proclaim themselves to be Christian and believers, but their lifestyle, attitudes, and actions seem to contradict this? Should we approach with brotherly love and point out these contradictions? Well, I'm not going to answer this, but we recently studied this. <laughs> There's a passage of scripture that we were in just a couple weeks ago that I think absolutely speak to this, but I want to give you guys the chance first. 
Um, one, I was, how do we approach it in love? Yeah. In love. I think when the question is how do we approach this in love? Remember that yep. Christ first loved us. Christ loved us even in our iniquities. And so, um, you know, and while we were sinners, I mean, while we were sinners, Christ first loved us. So I would say one, not from a spirit of admonishment or from rebuking or from um, anger or from all the other things that we might be frustrated with somebody who claims to be a believer and acts differently. Um, one is, is this the spirit of love? A kind word turns away sure. wrath. Yep. And uh, there is, so uh, in love, in yep. love, we must approach a brother and say, or a sister and say, hey, look, that's not of God. Yep. You can't, you can't claim to be of us and do things that are not of us and be a part of us. It just right. doesn't work. Um, right. But it has to be in the spirit of love. Yeah. It has to be a spirit of, for it to be received and to be to receive well. Because if your goal is for them to turn from what they are doing to truly no longer be a part of the things that you consider them not to be of God, well then, if you go to them in any way other than not in love, you're working against what your ultimate goal is. Yeah. You know. So first off, in love. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Truth, in love, mm-hmm. yep. with humility, full of grace. Yep. Um, I think one of the things for me too, and it's something I'm becoming even more aware of, in, especially in this day of social media and everything else, and then, so it's a two-part thing there. Number one, what's, what is our motive? Are we truly seeking restoration and reconciliation for sure. that person? Right. Or are we seeking to make ourselves look ooh, some other way? Um, that bleeds into the whole social media versus whatever. Yeah. So the things that we're talking about, personal sin, personal issues, that's to be dealt with personally. Yeah. Not in a public forum, not on Facebook. If it's, if it's posted on Facebook, it is not for restoration and reconciliation. Agreed. There's an agenda or something else there. Now, the person asked this question didn't say that that was the case. I just with everything going on, I felt like I needed to say that. So what's the motive? Is it personal? Keep it personal. In love, with humility, yep. full of grace. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, good word. I mean, again, you're asking, should we approach with brotherly love and point out these contradictions? And I would absolutely say yes. Um, recently in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 7, uh, Jesus himself says, in 7 verse 4 through 6 or how can you say to your brother let me remove the speck from your own eye and look a blank is in your own eye hypocrite first remove the plank from your own eye mm-hmm. then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye okay and i'll stop there yeah. um the implication there is you are to be about removing the speck from your brother's eye jesus doesn't say don't attempt to do it there's a command to do it Go back to 1 John. If you see a brother in sin, pray. We are to be involved, yes. But to Jimmy and Bobby's point, we do so with grace, we do so with love, having evaluated our own selves first. Mm -hmm. We recognize the speck in another's eye because we've got a plank made of the same material in our own eye. We know their sin because we're familiar with it. Okay, so any of you out there looking at another believer and going, oh, look at that, you're probably guilty of it in your own life as well. That's not me being condemning. That's me being, that's me saying, okay, evaluate yourself, evaluate your heart. Maybe you've recovered, maybe you've been reconciled because of a particular sin or issue in your life. Now you're able to go to that person with humility, with grace, with mercy, with an intent to reconcile, to say, hey, I've dealt with this too. Or I've seen this in your life because I'm familiar with it. And I love you. And as a brother or sister in Christ, I wanna, I wanna exhort you. And so, yes, I absolutely believe we should. Yep, okay. agreed. All right. Um, This one was specifically addressed to me, and I like it. Um, Not that it was addressed to me. I like the question. Um, So I want to tackle it quick. Um, This person says, I have thought that for the Antichrist to come to power, the world will have to come together to acknowledge a world leader. I wondered how this could be possible. But recently I read about an organization that is attempting to bring about agreement between nations concerning rebuilding economies post-COVID. Is this an unfolding of biblical prophecy? Uh, Let's answer that first. Uh, It could be, yes. Uh, It might not be, uh, but it could be. Mm -hmm. As Christians, and and this person writes, I suppose it could be. Uh, So you're right. As Christians, we are called to oppose evil in all its forms, but Peter was rebuked twice by Jesus for interfering with God's plan when he thought he was opposing evil. Remember when Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. When the end times are upon us, nations will behave more and more in ungodly ways. 
what would the proper mindset of a Christian be? Compliance or opposition? Mm. Okay, um, a good, good question wow. here. And, and there's a lot there, so forgive me if I don't maybe answer it exactly, if I don't maybe answer the exact question you're asking. <clears throat> there is a lot that's happening right now, okay? Mm-hmm. And I think it is our tendency and not entirely wrong for us to look at the events that are going on around us and to go, whoa, like this seems to be a lot of stuff that's kind of the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, and, and what does that, you know, what does that mean? Like what... Is, is the Antichrist coming to power? Is the Antichrist already in our midst? Is, is this an attempt at a one world economy and a one world government? And listen, guys, here's the answer. And I know we've said this a lot today. We don't fully know, okay? Um, here's what we do know. The rapture of the church, uh, the return of Christ for the church uh, is imminent. We believe here at Calvary Chapel in the doctrine of imminency meaning that his return for his church, his bride, via the rapture of the church, could happen at any moment. Meaning that, the implication of that, is there's no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled at this point for that event to occur. We're not looking for anything to happen to give us insight or to give us an alert that, oh, here comes Jesus for the rapture. It's imminent, it could happen at any moment, and Jesus himself said, nobody knows. Nobody knows, okay? Um, Now, uh, as far as the Antichrist, well, we know in, where is that at? In 2 Thessalonians, Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica, a young church that he had, in a very short period of time, given a lot of eschatology to, talked to them about the events of the end times. And so, by the way, somewhat of an indictment on churches today who want to go, ah, we're not going to go there. That's too complicated. We don't want to talk about those things. It's too difficult to understand. Stop it. We are to be about these things. Paul himself says, I want to tell you this so that you're not ignorant. Okay? So we do need to be talking about the end times. We need to be talking about eschatology. And in 2 Thessalonians, Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica once again to address some confusion that was happening. And he tells them, of the great apostasy in chapter two and a falling away, okay? And he says here, let no one deceive you. This is verse three of chapter two. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, that's the antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination of desolation. When he does that, it will be clear to all that he is, um, or it will be clear to many that he is the Antichrist. It says in verse four, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time, okay? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The spirit of the Antichrist, if you will, is already at work in our world. He who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. What does that tell me? That when the church is removed, when the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit through his church in this world is raptured out of this world, then the Antichrist will be revealed, okay? So what we need to understand here, and the reason I make this point is because it's tempting for us right now to say that this person's Antichrist, this person's Antichrist, this person's Antichrist. I've heard in the last two weeks about four different people who people believe are the Antichrist. They might be. They could be. I, you know, if Jesus is coming back soon for his church, then chances are the Antichrist is, is alive and working and doing some things right now. Maybe the Lord will tarry for another many, many years. Maybe we're about, maybe we're on the verge of another Jesus movement. Maybe we're on the verge of another great awakening and, and Jesus isn't going to rapture his church for another 60 years. Then maybe the Antichrist isn't around right now. And some of the events that are happening right now are just a stirring and an awakening and in God's grace and his mercy, he wants more to come to him. And so maybe that's what's happening right now. You know who a lot of people thought was the Antichrist was Adolf Hitler. Mm-hmm. Okay, that guy's gone now. Um, and so the point being here is I'm not looking for the Antichrist, mm-hmm. nor will I know who the Antichrist is this side of glory. 
I'm going to be gone when the Antichrist is revealed, okay? I know that some people have a different eschatology and they think that we'll be here. I do not. I don't think Scripture teaches that. I think Scripture teaches that Christians, his church, will be gone. I'll be in heaven worshiping in the throne room of heaven when the Antichrist is revealed. Um, I don't know how perfect knowledge will work at that particular time, but maybe we'll know then that those events are happening. Maybe that's be, be something that's going on within our time of worship. Right. But that's going to be going on here, and I'm going to be there. Um, now, uh, how will he come to power? We'll, we'll look at what's happening around us, okay? Mm -hmm. Are some of the things that are going on right now part of the end times fulfillment? Again, maybe. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be that hard for us to imagine at this point and to think about the world right now, all of which feels like they're under this pandemic, all of which feel like we're sort of unified right now in crisis, um, are, uh, are looking at circumstances that could bring about a one world economy, okay? That's being talked about. One world religion. I don't know all the details of this, but I know that the Pope recently presented to the United Nations a format, basically, for what could be a one world religion. Yeah. Um, we've got peace treaties in the Middle East. Yeah. That's unreal. Um, so there are a lot of things happening. Imagine if a very savvy, very influential leader kind of came to the forefront of the world right now on the world stage and was able to, in a convincing way, promise peace and safety. Mm -hmm. Do you not think the majority of the world would go, yes, let's oh, go, yeah. Oh yeah. right? Might this person use a vaccine to promise peace and safety? Maybe. Might this person use a, 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 a currency to suggest mm -hmm. ease and stability in financial markets? Sure. So that's all to say these things could be happening. But they might not. So what are we to do as Christians to the last part of that question? Well, what are we supposed to do? Matthew 28, 19. <laughs> Go into all the world, yep. preach the gospel, right? We, we are to be about salt and light in this culture. So we look for Jesus, not the Antichrist. We preach the word, not the news of the world. And we stay on mission, okay? Yep. Agreed. Good? Absolutely. All right. You guys get this last one. Okay. Uh, okay. This was a couple Sundays ago. Um, the question was, uh, I was in Matthew 7, 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. But then, so that speaks to like, this is a narrow way to Jesus. Yep. And I talked about the difficulty. In fact, for the past two Sundays, I've kind of alluded to the fact that the Christian life isn't easy. Yeah, it's not an easy life, right? right? But in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is this a contradiction? No. Is the difficulty of the Christian life and... The burden of Jesus being light are those two things a contradiction? Well, I, I don't think so. I think, first of all, I think that we mistake simple and easy. Yes. Ooh, yeah. 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 Great point. Right, yeah. It is very simple. Yeah. We believe, we trust, we repent, we ask, yeah. we follow. Um, that's simple. Is it easy? Absolutely not. It is contrary to our world, it's contrary to our flesh, it's contrary, it's, it is not an easy process at all. But again, that doesn't keep it from being simple. We make it a whole lot harder than it has to be. So, sure. so knowing that, um, I believe our Savior has said, look, it's gonna, we've given you a simple way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It doesn't get much simpler than that. Um, but you're gonna struggle, you're gonna experience trials, you're gonna have a hard time, you're gonna be opposed to the world, the world's gonna be opposed to you, Come to me. Let me show you how to do it. Yeah, that's yeah. the simple solution for a a hard, a difficult, yeah, process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think of. Do I see this as a contradiction? No, absolutely not. I see them as two separate things. I think one is that when we come to a believer, there are things that that are. It doesn't mean that like life stops being hard. I mean, we live in a fallen world. It doesn't mean that like when we come, you know, to to Christ and all of a sudden like all of our problems are going to be completely taken away and we live this like you know perfect blessed life because we still live on a fallen earth as believers living in a fallen earth hoping for life eternal in heaven 
like that's our best life. We're gonna live yeah. our, you know, to say like live yeah, your yeah. best life now. Yeah. Your best life's gonna be in heaven. Yeah. You're still gonna struggle as a believer on this earth. But what does the Lord promise us, even though as we continue to struggle on this earth as human beings, warring against our earthly pleasures and desires and all the things that you know our flesh warring against the spirit. Um, you know, I go this, I go like Philippians, right? So Philippians four seven, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. That yeah. peace of Jesus Christ is going to help to continue to give us rest when we are burdened, when yeah. we are heavy laden, to get the things of this earth that we're going to struggle against. Like, yeah, absolutely. No, is yeah. it a contradiction? No. And unfortunately, though, I do think that we have. Um, we we've talked about this too in the past. The prosperity gospel. Yeah. There are theologies in this country which are propagated to say that. You know, that treats Jesus into a spiritual vending machine that says I get to, you know, put my put my money into it and I can punch whatever I want out and all the stuff of this earth and I never have to struggle again. And, and I was like, that's just not true. It's yeah. not true because as a believer, we still live in a fallen world. Like, how do we not grasp that? You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, exactly. Um, exactly. But yeah, and, and, and to your point, and yeah, we really we missed the boat on simplicity versus easy. And we do. We... And I think that one of the things as, um, man, one of our members pointed out on Sunday afternoon is like, in the current COVID situation that we live in is because we live in a culture of immediacy. Yeah. And we struggle with the immediacy. And I think even as Christians, um, myself included, struggle with the, the the need to have it now. Yeah. And we want it fixed now. Yeah. You know? But what it is, turn to God. That yeah. peace he knows no understanding. Yeah. And it will be given unto you. And pray for that peace in, in the midst of your struggles. Because you're gonna struggle. Like yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. To, yeah, I think it's it's a well said guys. I think to me, Matthew eleven is really the solution to Matthew seven fourteen. Yes. Right? I think they are very consistent and it's sort of like because of this, then this, right? So because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it, take my yoke upon you right. and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light Jesus here continued to kind of reinforce, I am the way, I'm the narrow way, I'm the gate. It's gonna be difficult in this life. And I think a lot of times what we confuse, this idea of all you who labor and are heavy laden, then I will give you rest, take my yoke upon you. Look, Jesus doesn't say here, what, what does it mean to take his yoke upon you? If we're picturing sort of like a yoke on an oxen mm -hmm. out in the field, by us taking his yoke upon us, implies there that we're gonna to continue to work. Yeah. He doesn't say yeah. take, he doesn't yeah. say take yeah. off the yoke and go into the barn and settle in for the night. Right. Right. He says you're going to keep working, but you're going to work with me, mm -hmm. and I'm going to make it easier for you. Right? Yep. And so yeah, we we're still in this life. You want to do it alone? You want to do it on your own? You want to try and do this thing, or do you or do you want to go? Man, Jesus, life in this world is tough. Right. I want, I, want, I want you to help me with this. And then when he does, then again, scripture is consistent. Then that peace which surpasses all understanding that guards your heart and mind, that doesn't make sense. Suddenly you're like, man, life is pretty hard here, but I'm doing okay. You're doing great. I, I got the joy of the Lord. Yeah. I love Jesus, right? Like that's when you start to look like those weird Jesus freaks where people are like, man, what's wrong with you? And you're like, right. I don't know. <laughs> I just got Jesus. Yep. And, and life is better. Yep. And it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't look like it should be better. But it is. Why? Because I've taken his yoke upon me. Yep. Because he's helping me. He's carrying me through it. So to me, I see these things go perfectly together. Absolutely. And it's Jesus continuing to draw us unto himself and saying, hey, listen, let me help you. And that's what grace and mercy is about. Mm -hmm. It's you, you deserve death. You deserve hell. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. But I'm going to die for you and restore you and give you eternal life. And, and then I'm going to call you to a life that I'm going to help you to live. That's what grace is, right? Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And um, it's just because of that, it's an amazing God that we serve. And so I hope that answers your question. Yep. Yeah, man. Yeah. And yeah. that always. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, look at that. We're right on time. Even, That's awesome. Even early, despite our technical difficulties. So, any, do we have uh, any questions pop up? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any. Okay, um, I don't. I don't think I saw any Tiff uh, <laughs> Any Tiffany's come through. I'm reading Tiffany on there right now. Okay. Um, any more questions come through? So. Toward that end, guys, we're blessed to be with you again today. Sorry for our technical difficulties. If you want to go ahead and um, once we post this here, we finish and post it, please. Um, this isn't us looking for 
likes. Um, I'm not even on social media, so I can't follow that, but like share it, okay? Share the video. Um, do that with all of our services. Let's get the word out there. As long as people are on social media, let's make sure the gospel is going forth. And for those of you who prefer YouTube, this will be posted on YouTube here later this afternoon. Appreciate you guys, and uh, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, uh, Lord, you're a good God, a good Father. It's a great day, Lord, and you've given us breath in our lungs. And Lord, we have uh, thus far today sought to use that breath to bring you glory and to praise you. And uh, Lord, we're not worthy of anything that you do for us. Uh, and certainly, Lord, to come into your presence. And so, Lord Jesus, we give you thanks uh, that you have made a way uh, for all of these things. And Lord, we exalt your name here this morning. And we do pray, Lord, for all of those who have joined us and those who will tune in later on, that Lord, you would watch over them, you'd bless them, you'd encourage them. And Lord, you'd do a great work in us and through us, Lord, that it'd be for your glory and uh, would bear much fruit in the lives of others. Lord, we love you, we praise you, uh, we thank you for this day. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God bless you guys and have a wonderful day. Yay!